In the realm of scientific progress, transformative breakthroughs resonate and permeate our daily lives by deepening our understanding of the world we inhabit. At the American Physical Society, we take pride in shedding light on the diverse backgrounds, unique journeys, and captivating stories that shape our vibrant community in their relentless pursuit of knowledge and discovery. Since our inception in 1899, APS has been at the forefront of advancing the frontiers of physics, disseminating knowledge across the globe for the betterment of all. In this spirit, APS serves as a beacon, illuminating the lifelong dedication of remarkable individuals in their unwavering quest to positively impact the world around us. In the ever-evolving landscape of scientific discovery, the future is shaped by early career scientists, innovators who bring fresh perspectives, bold ideas, and transformative approaches. These rising stars breathe new life into the pursuit of excellence. At APS, we are proud to champion the growth, recognition, and success of this dynamic community. The George E. Valley Jr. Prize celebrates an emerging luminary whose groundbreaking work holds the promise of profound impact. This year, we honor Ruben Verison for pioneering contributions to the quantum dynamics and topology of strongly coupled systems, enabling the creation of highly entangled states, including the first non-abelian phase in quantum platforms. I find it incredibly beautiful. The idea that you start with something messy and hard to understand, and by just having more of it and zooming out, it becomes simpler. I remember my first exposure to physics was actually, I think I was around 12. My older brother was having physics at that point in time in school, and his book was just lying around. And I just remember feeling surprised, I almost even annoyed that people knew this and no one told me. Indeed, my initial interests were really drawn to what is the most microscopic scale we can understand. The idea being, once we understand all the microscopic constituents and how they interact, everything else is like a detail. But of course, it's kind of also intuitively clear that even if you were given all the fundamental laws, we'd still have a large gap to bridge to our actual everyday life. And that's because of the notion of emergence. It's almost hard to give examples of emergence because it's almost all we know. If you think of, say, a water wave you know, on Lake Michigan over there, we know microscopically just the, you know, billions upon billions of water molecules that are moving up and down. It's a complete mess. But then if we zoom out, of course, we know from daily life that we don't need to worry about all those molecules. If you understand the surface of the water, there's some effective wave and some ripple that might move. It might have some approximate velocity, it might have some approximate shape. And it almost looks there's some emergent entity we can point at and we can talk about. And that's an example of an emergent phenomena. And things get even more interesting once you involve quantum physics, because quantum physics is our most fundamental understanding of how nature is, and it also happens to be super weird. My favorite mode of research is just scribbling on a piece of paper, scratching it out, trying a bunch of things, or discussing with others at the blackboard. Part of research for me is trying to trust those gut intuitions as well, just knowing, okay, I can't really tell why, but somehow it's not the right time for this concept. Sometimes you just have to, you know, keep banging away at it, trying ideas and knowing most of them will fail, but each time you fail, you learn about what not to do. For me, the challenge in emergence is what kind of materials would keep their weirdness at a macroscopic scale? But it's a evolving goal because we already have many examples like superconductors that are used every day in MRI scanners. I'm not trying to make a product that we can sell and be weird. It's just, it's a really kind of a useful way of trying to understand things. And it, it very naturally leads to the current day study of, of trying to build quantum computers and quantum processors. And for that, we just need to understand quantum physics better and emergence better. And once we understand both, we can build these type of materials. I would say macroscopically, every idea kind of naturally follows on the next. Only when you zoom out, maybe, that there seems to be fundamentally new insights. I'm always just focusing on the concepts that I find most interesting for their own sake. And the thing that keeps me going is just the curiosity and being able to share it with other people and the discussions. If I would, you know, 
have a chance to talk to you know, uh, my younger self discovering this whole field, I guess firstly I would just say have fun. It's as fun as it looks. And also it's going to be even more fun once you start doing research. It's more about being able to share kind of the joy of understanding these concepts. And in that sense, it's very nice to be part of this larger community that makes it fun. A career in physics is a testament to unwavering dedication, an unrelenting pursuit of knowledge that demands perseverance and passion. But when this journey is paired with the ability to captivate audiences, inspire students, and mentor the next generation, a physicist rises to true excellence. The Julius Edgar Lillenfeld Prize celebrates those who not only push the boundaries of physics, but also master the art of sharing its profound insights with the world. In 2025, we proudly present this honor to Bharath Ratra for pioneering research in cosmology and particle astrophysics, including on the quantum mechanics of inflation, dark energy dynamics, and for contributions to science education and popularization at all levels. It's pretty, pretty impressive that all the elements, the light elements were generated in the Big Bang and then um, stars formed and they fused together the light elements to give us carbon and oxygen and nitrogen. I mean, that's what we have here, lots of carbon and oxygen. And it all came out of the stars after they exploded. I was interested in general relativity and quantum mechanics as an undergrad uh, pretty early on. I got to the U.S. in the fall of 82, and inflation was kind of just being developed around then. That's uh, a model of what happens in the very, very early universe when maybe about 10 to the minus 35 seconds after, I guess, what we'd call the Big Bang, the whole observable part of the universe now was smaller at some point than an atom and smaller than the nucleus of an atom. Like when you're a toddler, you kind of access um, a very small set of length scales. You can't touch an atom with your finger. You're not going to access a star through your fingers. So maybe that's why people find it's unintuitive. I started getting interested in talking to people outside of physics, even when I was an undergraduate in college. There's a whole bunch of reasons. So one is it's kind of really joyful and beautiful, right? It is reality, and it's useful for people to know that there is a reality out there. We have a sort of expanding universe here. It's a two-dimensional universe. The space is two-dimensional. We live in a three-dimensional universe, and I can't show you a three-dimensional expanding universe, so I'm showing you a two-dimensional one. And you have to think of this as just the surface. These red pieces of paper, these red stickers are my galaxies. What's happening is that the space between them is getting bigger as the balloon expands. Because um, space is expanding and everything lives in space, the wavelengths get stretched by the expansion of space and the distance between galaxies gets stretched by the expansion of space. But after the galaxies have formed, they don't get affected by the expansion of the universe. But while they're forming, when they're baby galaxies, those guys get affected. It's very difficult to get these analog demonstrations of the expansion of the universe I mean, because we're just not used to physics on those length scales. And you have to come up with whatever you can to try to make it a little bit simpler. Life is really complicated now. And you can't have informed citizens uh, who don't appreciate some science and some technology. It helps me sometimes to go away from what I'm working on and go on walks or hikes and do different things. And 
then I can come back and maybe I'll have some ideas then. You can drive for 10 minutes and you can get out into the prairie. It used to all be tall grass prairie, so you'd have grass that would be eight to 10 feet tall. Beautiful places motivate me. I don't know if they motivate me to do the work, but they're nice places and you kind of see stuff that you don't see at work. All of science is kind of connected. There's this famous quote from John Muir, you pull on something and you find it's connected to many other things. Hopefully understanding of science and understanding of nature will motivate people to try to preserve more of the natural areas that are left. The APS Medal for Exceptional Achievement in Research represents the pinnacle of scientific excellence. It honors contributions that have reshaped our understanding of the intricate fabric of the universe. As the most prestigious accolade of the American Physical Society, this medal is awarded to those whose lifelong dedication to discovery has left a profound and lasting impact on the field of physics. In 2025, we proudly confer this honor upon Paul Corkum for the synthesis of plasma physics, strong field spectroscopy, and electron scattering concepts to form a new science of strong field physics, ranging from atomic to solid state physics, as well as for the pioneering of attosecond science. rare that you have a chance to find something universal in matter. I was excited for day after day after day with this. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd be excited. I just think, wow, isn't this neat? So if you take a second and you divide it into a million pieces, you have a microsecond. So a million times a million times a million pieces. That's an attosecond. An attosecond is to a second as a second is to the age of the universe. So it's amazing when you think about it. Think about how much different the world is now compared to the time of the Big Bang. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that you say, so, so what? It can't have anything to do with our real life. Our real life is the second life. But of course, all matter is held together with electrons. And so really the world of electrons is the world of attoseconds, and the world of us is the world of seconds, right? <laughs> but it's there and it's important to us because it, because it underlies just about everything. Just about everything. I grew up close to water and my, my father, he took me on the boat and so I was around the boats a lot when I was really young. And so I liked water. Many things I think that you look at in water waves can move over into light waves. I found my niche in science. I joined a group here at National Research Council trying to make it shorter flashes of laser light. Most laser people are afraid to think about atoms, molecules, and solids. They're really into optics and they're thinking about it. And there are people, of course, that think about atoms, molecules, and solids, but they didn't know much about lasers and they were maybe a little afraid to think of lasers. And so I thought, ah, there's, a, there's my place right there in the middle. And so I tried to understand uh, intense light interacting with atoms, molecules, and solids. And it's from that that the attoseconds grow. There is no such thing as an attosecond laser. The attosecond laser that you think of is really a conventional laser that we can control really well. We're really good at conventional lasers. Interacting with an atom, a molecule, a solid, whatever it is often atoms, and then it's through that interaction that we create the attosecond pulse. Yeah, you could think of it like a flash of light like you have in your flash camera. And so the camera might be open for a while, but you illuminate the face just for a short time and it stops the, it stops the motion and things like that. So this is the fastest thing that we as humans can control. It's not really a camera that you take it with anymore, but something the equivalent to a camera. And so I'm going to illuminate something with an attosecond, which is again amazing, isn't it? 
It's really neat. In 93, I published a paper saying electrons coming back and colliding, talking about really the way we look at it now. And almost immediately that I knew that you could make attoseconds and I began to talk about how you make them, how you'd measure them. All of a sudden, I would go to conferences and people would be just around me, swarming around me. It was the first time I'd ever had such a thing and it was very exciting. I think any new advance in technology opens up potential doors and there's lots of smart people around, so lots of people come up with new ideas that you couldn't have done before because the technology wasn't there, but now the technology is there. The most important thing, I think, from attoseconds is not measuring something fast. I think it's really important that this is a way, universal response of matter to intense light. And so I think in some ways that's even more important than any one measurement that you can make with something faster, that you found something universal response of matter. I mean, I go, go back to 1993 when I first came up with the idea, and I, I mean, I didn't expect it to go quite so far. You found a new idea that nobody has ever had. You can see that it will remain powerful as further you look down the field, no matter what, it won't go away. I look at it as fun and problems and puzzles and ideas that might have a real impact. I'm very proud of what I've accomplished. I would say follow your interest, follow something you think you have a chance of solving. That's where you're going to have the best ideas, right? Because you're going to be thinking about it all the time.